Our lesson tonight is entitled The Four Great Calls of God, and we get many calls in our life. And it's kind of like the sermon I did one time on the rocks that we've had to put the big rocks in first so that we can get the things that are important done. And then if we put the little rocks in first, we don't always get the big rocks done. There was a man whose wife said, Oh, I called the kids and they're not coming for Thanksgiving. And that really distresses me. Can you do anything? Can you call them? So the husband thought about it for a minute. He said, yes, I'll call him. So he calls up his son. And he says, uh, his son lived in Arizona. And he said, you know, I tell you what's going on. Mom and I are just not getting along. And we're thinking about getting divorced. We've been married 40 years. And they've been kind of miserable. Things aren't going well. And I just don't know how much longer we can last. You know, I was thinking right after Thanksgiving of just just throwing in the towel and getting a divorce. Oh, the son said, oh, you can't do that. Let me call my sister. And so he gets on the phone and calls his sister and says, Dad's thinking about getting divorced. Can you imagine that? We've got to go home for Thanksgiving and talk them out of that. And so uh, she says, well... That just can't happen. We'll just go home for Thanksgiving. We'll straighten them out and make sure they don't get a divorce. So she calls up Dad and said, we're going to be there for Thanksgiving. My brother and I, she lived in Denver too. We're going to be there. We'll be there for Thanksgiving. But don't you dare think about getting a divorce. That's not something we want. So uh, she calls her brother and says, okay, we're going to be there for Thanksgiving and and that's set, and they make their plans, and they're going to fly in together, and they're going to get there, and they're going to be there for Thanksgiving. He walks into his wife. He says, Dear, I solved the problem. Our kids will be home for Thanksgiving, and they're paying their own way. <laughs> oh, my. Well, we get these calls in life, and they're kind of important. Focus on what's important. But we get many calls in life. Some are important. Some are things that, well, some of them are spam, really, because they're not things that really need to take up our, our time and our attention. But th sometimes we get those calls. Uh, we should answer some and reject others. There's some that are important and some that really just, just are not the type of thing we need to follow. But some are greater calls than others, and, th and they're the ones that we need to focus on, the things that are important. Especially notice these great calls, the great calls that God has given us. The first one is the call of the gospel. We know the gospel is important and it's the greatest call that we can ever have to come to Jesus, to come and be obedient to his will. Everyone is called by the gospel. In 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 14, to which he called you by our gospel for the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so we're called by the gospel, to be obedient to Christ, to come to him so we can attain the glory. The glory, uh, the gospel has the power to save us in Romans 1, 16, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. You know, we don't pay tic uh, buy a ticket to go to a football game or watch it on TV to just see them in the huddle. What's in the huddle is important, but what really counts is the plays they make, and the touchdowns they make, and the scores that they make. That's what we watch the games for. We come here to huddle, so to speak, and to get recharged so that we can go out and teach other people about Jesus and encourage other people, and we strengthen each other and build each other up and do what we can to take care of each other. But we're to get out into the world and make a difference in this world, so we leave the huddle to go and be active in the community that we live in so that they can see that Christ lives in us. Number three, we're called to be saints, to be what God would want us to be. In 1 Corinthians 1 and 2, it says, To the church of God which is at Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, 
with all who in every place call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, or Jesus Christ our Lord. And so we're called to be saints. Saints are the sanctified people. We find the sanctifying power in the blood of Christ. And that blood of Christ washes away our sins in the waters of baptism. And here we're called saints. We don't have to wait and wait till some church decides that we are a saint. We're a saint when we're called by God to be obedient to his will and we follow it. There was a young lady and she was, uh, she had a tough job. She went and taught children who were in the hospital as a substitute teacher. She, she went to the students because they were too sick to come to school. And she got a call and they said, would you go see this boy? He's in the hospital. He's not doing very good. He's been burned and if you look at him, it'll just be a fright. But we need somebody with a strong stomach that can go and make him feel like that learning is important. And so she went to the burn unit. The burn unit is a real hard unit to go to, into. And she went to the boy's bed and, and she begins to tell him about nouns and pronouns and they do some math problems. And at first he wouldn't look at her. He, he kept looking out the window, but then he changed and looked at her and she, she, she kept her grip on herself and she didn't, didn't make a grimace or anything like that. She kept looking at him and going over the assignment. And, and she gave him some encouragement there, you know, to get his studies done and to do things. And she left him some uh, cards to study that he needed to go over those cards and learn what nouns and pronouns were and learn his math problems too. Well, that lady made that day with that, that boy, and the next day she came, and the nurses stopped her, and the nurses said, you must have done something, because we have thought this kid's going to not make it. We thought he's going to die. He hasn't been trying. He hasn't been doing anything, and now you come, and all of a sudden, he's brightened up, and he's doing good, and uh, we think he's going to make it now. You must have made a big difference in your life. Do you know what you did? And she says, well, I don't know what I did, but I'll ask him what's going on. And so she went and asked him. He says, the, the nurses say you're doing better. Do you know why? He says, well, I thought that the school wouldn't spend their money and spend their time to send a teacher out here if I was going to die. And if I need to learn about nouns and pronouns, then I'll learn them. But I thought it was hopeless that my life was over. So she, she gave him some encouragement by her being there, by her teaching, and by her not grimacing when she saw his face that had been badly burned. Well, sometimes our presence makes a difference in people and in the way that they live, in the way that they are, are, are called by God. Jesus calls the sinner. It's, it's interesting. He said, I didn't come to take care of all those people who are riches, who are righteous and living all these people, the Pharisees, they, they really didn't pay much attention to him. The Sadducees didn't either. He says, I came to call those who are sick. In Matthew 11, 28 through 30, he says, Come to me, all who labor and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your soul. So he's offering solace there. He's offering a way for us to have some peace. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus stands at the door and knock. And when I've told this before, I told you the door didn't have a handle or a way for anybody to get in. It has to be open from the inside and not from the outside. In Revelations 3.20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with he, him and he with me. So that's a relationship there, but he stands at the door, but we're the ones who have to open the door. We're the ones that have to invite him in. We're the ones who have to listen, and we're the ones who have to be obedient to his will. He's not going to force us, but we need to grab a hold to him and uh, understand that we need him and we need to stay connected to him. 
In Luke 19 and verse 10, it says, For the Son of Man did not come to seek and to save, uh, for the Son of Man has come to seek and save that which was lost. So that was his mission, and that's part of our mission too, to seek and to save those who need saving. There was a lady whose husband had been in a bad fire, and his face had become disfigured. He would no longer go out in public anymore and kind of shut her out. Barely ever did anything with her and he just stayed in his room and there was just enough of him attention to go and eat and go back to his room. He was really drawn out by that fire. Well, this lady had the strangest request and when she finally got to see the plastic surgeon, which is very hard to even get an appointment to, she begged this plastic surgeon, would you disfigure my face so it looks like my husband's after the fire? Uh, he says, I've never had anybody want to do that. Would you explain what's going on? And she says her husband won't let her in, won't see her, won't, won't go out in public, won't do anything. So she thought if she disfigured her face that... Uh, her husband might let her in and, and, and be more open to seeing her. And he says, I won't do that, but I will come with you and I'll go to your house and I'll talk to him. And that's very rare for a doctor to do that, a plastic, a plastic surgeon. So he came to their house and he knocked on the door and she let him in and took him to outside the bedroom door and he knocked on it, and the guy said, I won't come out and talk to you. He said, I'm here to fix your face. I can fix it. I can make it better. I can make it well. And he wouldn't listen to him at all at first. And then he says, I want to tell you what your wife did. Your wife came to my office and asked me to disfigure her face so that it would look like yours, so that you, you would accept her and still be a part of her world. And he, that guy couldn't believe it either. And, and finally he opened the door. He saw the doctor. And the doctor was able eventually to operate on him and fix his face where it's more presentable and where he felt good and accepted in public. But that wife was, really loved him to be willing to do all that for him. And that doctor was kind and compassionate to go that far too to reach out and to help this family. Well, we have Jesus Christ who died on the cross for our sins and he came that we might have life and that we might have life everlasting and he died on the cross to pay the penalty for our sins so we can be sanctified before God. The second call, the first call was the gospel. The second call is the call to Christian faithfulness. Once we become a Christian, we need to be faithful. We need to be counted on. We need to be people to, who, who, whose walk matches our talk. And we must make our calling and election sure according to the scriptures in Second Peter chapter 1 and verse 10. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure for if you do these things, you will never stumble. We need to be the type of people that don't stumble. We need to be faithful so that we stay true to God and not come as one of those people who might stumble. We're called to labor. We're called to service. In 1 Corinthians 15, in verse 58, it says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. So we know that what we do amounts to something. There was a preacher friend of mine. I was preaching in Rosebud, Texas, the first church I preached at after working for Texas Tech, and I called him up and he'd give me advice and one of these things he says, you know, it says God's word in the book of Isaiah, God's word will not return to you void. Just keep after it. Keep on going. Keep doing. And I'd ask him, well, various different things and he said, you're doing the right thing. Just keep on doing it. But God's word doesn't return to him void. God's word accomplishes what it's set out to do. And we need to trust God. And so in that way, we're carrying out God's mission. And we need to be the type of people that can be counted on to do God's will always.
Number three, we're called to be faithful. In Revelations 2 and 10, it says, Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested and that you may have tribulation ten days. Be faithful unto death and I'll give you the crown of life. Most people leave out the first part. He's not saying it's going to be an easy journey. It's not going to be an easy life. But we're going to be tested. We're going to have some difficult things that happen in our life, like we talked about in the sermon this morning. But he says, you be faithful unto death, and I'll give you the crown of life. We know that's the promise that he has given us. There was a policeman, and he was going about his journey, and he noticed this woman kept bending over and getting up, bending over and getting up, bending over and getting up. And so uh, she was in a park where kids normally play, and he went to her and he says, what on earth are you doing out here? I see you bend over and stand up, bend over and stand up. She says, I'm picking up glass where broken glass is so the kids on the playground won't cut themselves as they do that. He said, well, that's commendable. I just wondered what you were doing out here. And she wanted to make the world a better place for those kids by getting rid of the things that could harm them. We want to make the world a better place by getting rid of the harshness of sin and bringing people to the light of Christ. The third call is the call of death. And, well, I've seen this in, in my family this week, the loss of my uh, stepsister. She died this week. And the loss of John uh, Oliver um, Henry this week. The call of death, we don't know when it's going to happen, but it's going to happen sometimes. And we've got to be ready at all times because all will die. Every one of us will die unless we're still alive when the Lord comes. In Hebrews 9 and 27, it says, And it is appointed for men to die once. But after this, the judgment. We know the judgment is coming, but we've got to be ready. We're all going to die. We're all going to face it. This call comes to everyone, and we will all answer. We will all face it. In 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 15, For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. So we know when the Lord comes again in the clouds, he's going to bring those with him that had died previously. And then if we are alive, we're going to meet the Lord in the air. So we need to realize the call comes and we got to be ready to answer it. Tomorrows are not always certain. In James chapter 4 and 13 and 14, come now, you who say today or tomorrow, will go to such and such city, spend a year there, buy and sell and make a profit, whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. And so as we realize there, as it vanishes away. Uh, I was once told uh, by a teacher in class, this was in a Bible class at college, and they said, put a dot on, on the piece of paper, white paper, put a dot. And there was this long line, and he says, your life is just that little dot in this long line of eternity. It's just a little bit that's going to appear for a little while and vanish away. Make the most of your time while you got it. Our tomorrows are not certain, so we've got to be ready. And we say that again, we should be prepared in John 14, 1 and 2. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. I was reading this in a different version, and it said rooms. And there was a lady in the audience said, I don't want a room, I want a mansion. I said, okay. I think there's a song in the songbook of mansion, robe, and a crown. You know, something along that line. But Jesus has promised us a great place in heaven. A place to be with him, a place to be with God. And we've got a great place to go to and he's prepared it for us. But we've got to be prepared to go there. Number four is the call of the judgment, which we know that we will come. All will heed this call, both those who believe in God and those who do not believe in God. In 1 Peter 4, 17, for the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? That's kind of a sad thought. 
We know the judgment is coming to the house of God. We're, we're ready. We want to be ready. We'll be ready when the Lord comes. But those who are not uh, obedient to the gospel is going to be a sad day. So we got to get the new good news out to other people. Part of that's why we do our TV program. Part of that is why we have so many people taking Bible correspondence courses right now. We're doing some things here. We, we just got to keep on going and keep on doing. We're getting the word out to people in this world. Number two, what will the Lord's answer be whenever we call? He's got some that he calls, and some people uh, are on the... Really, they're, they're not really ready like they ought to be. In Matthew 25 and 46, it says, And these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. See, some people said, Well, we've done all these things, but Jesus said that they would go around into ever, everlasting punishment because they weren't doing the things the right way. They weren't doing the things in service to God. And they weren't obedient to God's will. It's kind of like those people who do not obey the gospel. We want to be the people that are obedient, the people who are righteous so that we can have eternal life. There was a young girl. Uh, she went to camp every year. She was a, a good teenager. She, she lived a good life. And she always sat on the fence. And uh, the preacher would call and talk to her about becoming a Christian. And she sat on the fence. Her parents would call and try to encourage her to become a Christian. Her grandparents would call and try to get her to become a Christian. She says, I'm on the fence. I'm fine. Finally, the day come that she died and she was still on the fence and Satan came along and said, I own the fence. Why does Satan own the fence? If you don't make a decision, Satan's got you. Satan doesn't want you to make a decision. Uh, he doesn't want us to ride on the fence. He wants us to be sure. He wants us to be right. He wants us to be in the right relationship. So we've got to be prepared for the great day. Jesus died on the cross for our sins, and he was in the tomb three days, and he rose again. And so to prepare, prepare for the great day, we've got to be baptized. As that picture symbolizes the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So in conclusions, here's what we say. Uh, we got to realize the great calls that these four calls are, how important they are, that these, these are important calls, the call of the gospel. We've got to be obedient to God's will. And we've got to be the type of people that follow after God and share the good news. Then he says the second thing, after we become a Christian, we need to be faithful. We're called to be faithful Christians, to serve him. And number three is the call of death, which we've got to be ready for at any moment, at any time. It could happen. And number four is the call of judgment, being ready to face God in the end. We talked a little bit about it this morning. We talked about that blood of Christ that covers us from our sins so that we can have everlasting life. If we answer the first two calls in obedience... And thus you'll be prepared for the last two call. If we obey, then we'll be right. Number three, all depends on you as to where you will spend eternity. During the Vietnam War, uh, whenever soldiers encounter the Viet Cong, they were very hesitant to be taken as a prisoner. They'd rather die than to be taken as a prisoner. Because they, they just couldn't stomach that in the way that they believed and the things that they did. But they came across this young boy. And this young boy had, he was probably 15 or 16 years old, they estimated. And he had been shot in his leg. He could not move. He couldn't get it up. He was losing blood from his legs. And the soldiers came and the Americans were going to save him. And... He kept throwing rocks at him and throwing dirt at him. Anything he could grab a hold of, he was trying to fight with all his might. One of the American servicemen took off his belt that had his gun with it so that he couldn't get that gun and fight him. And he went in and he put his arm under him and he helped him up and helped him get up off there and said, I'm not here to hurt you. They had an interpreter there among them that said, told him that they wasn't there to hurt him, but to help him. And they got him up. 
And they started getting him up and they dragged him towards the helicopter. They called to one of the units to call for a medic helicopter and the helicopter came. And that soldier that had helped him up decided he would go on the journey with him because this guy wouldn't let anybody else touch him, wouldn't let anybody help him or anything. So he got on the helicopter with the guy and he went out to the hospital that was in the ocean there. And after he got all that done, he got there, he began to accept his capture and realized they were there to help him and not to hurt him. And he was he felt so so blessed to be saved because his life was just about over when they got there. Well, our life is saved by the blood of Christ. And Jesus died on the cross so that we could have everlasting life. Tonight, if you have a need, won't you come as together we stand and sing.